All right, here we go. Grant Cardone, welcome back to Vlad TV. Man, I'm glad to be in your place this time. Yeah, yeah, you get to check out our New York office. Yeah, it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Well, you actually reached out to us this time. I'm kind of flattered. Yeah, man, because look, I love that interview we did last time, and, and, and your audience is different than mine, and a lot, of, a, lot of, a lot of the people that follow you are like, they're either really turned on about it or turned off about it, but I think a lot of people started thinking about, okay, you know, how do you play the IRS? How do you, how do you play the money game? And nobody knows. Nobody teaches us this. So I said, let me go back and see the big V-man and, and we, we educate or piss off his audience some more. Well, I think the thing that I appreciated most in our interview last time is that so many people try to sell people a dream and say like, you don't need a good job to start investing in real estate. You can start with zero money down and turn into, you know, become rich after a few years. And you said, look, if you want to make real money, you got, you got to do 32 units commercial, you know, uh, multi-unit, and you're gonna need a whole bunch of cash up front in order to do it. And if you don't want to, if you can't do that, then don't even bother. Yeah, it's just, look, you're going to end up having another job that doesn't pay you anything. Like, if you hate the minimum wage job you have now, you're going to hate the next one more. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, people are trying to get ahead by having two and three jobs that don't pay anything. Just because you supposedly own something, which means you got a mortgage on it that you don't own, and even if you did pay it off, you still got to make the property taxes. Mm -hmm. Just because it makes a little bit of money doesn't mean it makes sense. Yeah, and I can tell you, I have a close friend who's a, a real estate developer in D.C., and I ran some of the numbers by him, and I said, well, Grant said, you know, because I'm not a real estate guy, you know, I said, well, Grant said you should start with at least 32 units if you want to get into a real real estate business. And he said, well, actually, I feel it's 100. Oh. But, could, you know, 32 was cool, too. I could totally have that argument. Like, like you, once you do 100, you'll never go back to 32. It's like, you know, you know what's that saying? So, so like, once you, once you do scale, It'd be like Amazon saying, or Blackstone saying, they're going to buy my business. They're like, dude, we would never do that again. You know, that we, we, we're going to buy, we're going to buy 50 billion at a time. We're not going to bother with a, a, a little company. And this was the point of that. Like, now a lot of people just check out, as you know, Vlad, on this. They just get pissed off and say, well, I can't do that because I don't have the money. Okay. I didn't have the money either. I started with one deal, bought a deal put three grand down. I bought a deal with a budget. It was like I was going to the, to Whole Foods to buy uh, groceries. How much can we afford? I got 200 on me, so I'm going to buy $200 worth of shit. You, you can't do that with an investment. And I did that. And then that three grand was making me 200 bucks a month. I thought I was going to be great. I thought everything was going to be beautiful. There's no reason for me to tell this story except to share with people, one deal does not work. Because the moment they moved out, I was negative. I got scared. I dumped the property. I shouldn't have dumped it, but I had to because I didn't have the cash flow and didn't have the courage and didn't have the knowledge that the market would turn around and that I would get it rented. I, I got terrified. Uh, that that deal today is probably worth four hundred and fifty grand, and it and, and I put three thousand dollars down. It was worth. It's gone up five times. But if you can't keep it, it that's the problem with the stock market for me. You know, I couldn't keep Apple stock through the ups and downs. I never get to 258. Right. So you haven't bought any stock since our last interview, huh? Not a one, dude. Oh, well, I failed. I mean, I can't do it. I can't do it because, like, I, dr I drive around here. This, this, you know, it's just too easy. It's too easy to buy $250 worth of stock and still not know what you got. I got you. I got you. Well, after doing our last interview this was the number one kind of complaint comment that I kept seeing over and over again. And that's this. When you said that buying your home is a dumb idea, yeah. people think the reason you're saying that is because you own a bunch of rental property. You're trying to trick people into not owning anything so they can come rent with you. Oh yeah, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> Why not? Like, like, like look, it, it, you know, the only people that are trying to make sense of a house are people that, that are either trying to sell you a house. I'm not trying to sell anybody anything. Like, I'm trying to help people create financial freedom for themselves. There's not one report in the history of the world, 7 billion people, 
of anyone creating financial freedom because they bought a house. Jamie Dimon right here, he's on, he's on CNBC this morning talking about how great the economy is and the stock market's going up and the economy's going to be great over the next hundred years. He's not thinking about people buying a house when he says that stuff. He's thinking about his rich friends who are flying Gulf Streams and Globals and, 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 you know, these are the richest people on the planet. These people don't even talk about the house they bought. Don, Donald Trump down the street, he buys a house. He don't buy one house. He buys the whole building and lives in it. Now, the everyday guy that's like, well, I can't do that, man. I can, I can buy a little bit of the American dream by buying my house and, uh, you know, one day it'll be paid off. Go, go fly over Sao Paulo, Sao Paulo uh, Brazil. You're going to see so many vertical erected buildings. I thought they were all office buildings. It's not office buildings. It's all residentials. Millions of people living in little boxes in the sky under the belief that they're going to own that. That it's going to someday, one day be worth a bunch of money. It's not going to be worth a bunch of money. It's trapping people. Uh, people are making their biggest investment in their home when they should be making that same investment in themselves or their business. Not other real estate, by the way. It shouldn't be real estate. It should be in themselves or an idea or a business that produces cash flow or real estate that produces cash flow. Well, Airbnb is uh, kind of the newest thing right now when it comes to the real estate market. So a lot of people are feeling like, okay, I'm going to buy a house and I'm going to Airbnb it out. From your point of view, is that a real business or are you just spinning your wheels? I think it's going to be a, I think it's a, a, a economic opportunity right now that won't last. So I don't think it lasts. I, don't, I, I, think, I think all travel, travel and stay uh, de, de, demands a good economy. So if I go back to 2010, I know some guys that are making a bunch of money in the educational Airbnb business. They're educating people how to do what you just talked about. I don't know a lot of people making a lot of money doing it, but I do know a lot of people educating people about how to make a lot of money doing it. So uh, in the economy, when the economy fell apart in 2010, you know this, first thing that went is hotels, travel, airlines, spending money, period. Like people quit traveling. Businesses quit sending their salespeople out on the road. Everything got, everything went back home. And uh, that, the same thing that Airbnb, this money's got to be coming, these night stays have to be coming from somewhere. So when I come to New York, I either stay at the Peninsula, the Four Seasons, uh, Marriott, one of the hotels in the area, right? The Plaza, or, oh, wow, I'm going to go Airbnb now. I'm going to go stay in somebody's home. But if I don't come to New York for business anymore because the economy gets crushed, guess what? Everybody gets hurt. The Peninsula, the Four Seasons, the, the Plaza, they got money though. They, they can stay. But the Airbnb guy that depended upon Airbnb travel, uh, all of a sudden that guy gets whacked and he can't get his 80 bucks a day that his model's built on half the year, blah, blah, blah. He did the math and he's only got one unit. Again, you're still stuck with a you're stuck with a business that does not have dependable cash flow. And and a business is only as valuable as the dependent the 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 cash flow is dependable. Yeah, it's a great point. It's a great point. And you, and you touched on this with what you just said, but a lot of people feel a recession is coming in two, in 2020. Do you feel that's true or do you think that this is just people overreacting like they do I, I wouldn't doubt if we're not in it right now, Vlad. Like, you know, uh, I, I, watch, I watch these guys on Wall Street talk about how great the economy is. For who, man? Who's it great for? I got 175 employees that, that work for me down in Miami. Uh, 80 or 90 of them, without a, even doing a survey, I know 80 or 90 are having trouble. And, and I take care of people. I, I, I pay people fairly, but I can only pay people so much. The cost of living in most of these cities is so high. This city, like whacked ridiculous. The cost of living after taxes, uh, after renting a place, um, after the cost of food and transportation and insurance, and like it's so high and, and companies are not paying more money. Like we have the lowest unemployment 
that we've had in 50 years, maybe since I've been alive, wages should be just soaring straight up and they're not. So, yeah, so, well, so, we... so why, why not? Like the rich are getting richer and everybody else has, has had zero experience to the upside. Right. We actually posted up a, an article, which is kind of mind-blowing. Oh, hold on a second. Um, let me just pull this up. Uh, this was actually on Bloomberg, and they said the richest 1% of Americans are about to surpass the total wealth of okay. the middle class. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's crazy. How, how crazy is that when you say it out it's loud? It's crazy. It's insane. You're talking about massive, massive uh, shifts, transfers of wealth. Now, the question is, and I always ask this, who's got my money? This is what your viewers should be looking, asking themselves right now. Who's got my money? And you should be pissed off about it. You be, should be like, who's got my money? Not in a form of protest, but, but, but from a hunt standpoint. You know, I was 25 years old and I was broke. I had no money, but I got pissed off about it. I'm like, who's got my money, man? Who's got, who's got what I want? Who's got my dream? Who's got my business? And uh, that's what people need to ask themselves today. The wealthy are getting wealthier because the wealthy play by a different set of rules than everybody else. The Americans, the middle class, they're buying homes. This goes back to the home point. They're buying homes. They're buying cars. They buy country club memberships if they can afford them. They send their kids to good schools. They borrow money to go to college, they save their cash, and they invest in retirement accounts. Those are basically the seven themes of the middle class, and it ain't working for them. The wealthy do none of those things, okay? They, they don't borrow money to go to college. They send their kids to the best college and say, hey, don't fucking worry about learning anything, but meet the Obamas, okay? Make sure you meet, meet the people with the right names, Number two, they don't worry about buying houses. They buy businesses. They don't save cash. They know it's trash. And, and they invest in companies, and, and they'll do whatever it takes to get rich. Like, that is the priority, is to create wealth for themselves and their families. And they don't invest in retirement accounts. Well, you talked about a lot of deals last time in our, in our interview. And, you know, you mentioned your first deal of buying a single-family house and dealing with one renter who moved out. It, you know, you ended up uh, bailing out of it. Apart from that, when you look at your bigger deals, what was the worst deal you ever had? Worst deal I ever had that I did or that I didn't do? That you did. Okay, worst deal that I, that I did. Um, probably a deal I bought. I bought a deal uh, three years ago um, called Haran Point. It's 32 million. It was, a, it, was a, it was an exchange. So meaning, meaning I had a bunch of profit made on another deal I had sold in South Carolina. I had about $23 million of profits to shelter. So I moved part of that into an exchange. It's very, 1031 is fairly complicated. It, it's simple, but it becomes complicated when the, when the tick tock, when the clock starts going, okay, you're down to three days and you got to identify, then two days, then one day. And then you're like, no, I got to pull the trigger. So um, I bought a deal knowing that there wasn't going to be a lot of upside, but that I would protect my tax exchange. And I kept that deal for 34 months. This is a bad deal. Kept it for 34, just under 34 months. Uh, we had, I think in that deal, maybe $4 million, uh, $4 million profit on that deal. Short of that, maybe just short of $4 million. Okay, so when you sold it, you made four million off the deal. Uh, let me see. Is that right? It might be. It might yeah, it's shy of four million dollars that I made on that deal. It cash flowed like eight percent a year, so it wasn't it wasn't typical of what I would expect from a deal. It's like a twenty five percent return over three years, about eight percent a year. Okay. I didn't lose any money. I didn't lose my exchange. I did have a profit, but dude, it's not a. It wasn't a scorching score, and I didn't love the property. Okay, so out of all the property you ever bought, you never had to sell it, sell at a loss. Now, I've never sold an apartment deal at a loss. Really? And no. why is that? Because they all cash flow. Okay. So as long as what long, about look if I have if I have even through even through the recession, okay through the through the worst recession, as long as I have cash flow, 
okay? When, when, when the market tilts and there's no buyers, they're like, okay, I'm not moving. I know there's a good deal out in the marketplace, but I'm not moving right now because I'm uncertain. And that'll come. That, that's probably, you know, in the next year or two. The activity will drop because of certainty will drop. So I won't be able to trade my property because there'll be fewer buyers in the marketplace. Fewer buyers means the price goes down. The offers go down. I don't want to sell it. I don't want to lose money. So as long as I'm cash flowing, paying my debt and my expenses, as long as I'm cash flowing, I just wait that thing out. I wait the cycle out. Uh, in this case, I had something else I wanted to buy. There were some other reasons I wanted to exchange out. I'll look back probably later and say, dude, I should have waited and not sold that property. Right, but you have situations where areas just get messed up. Like you look at Detroit. Yeah, yeah at, totally. You know, who would have known that the car companies were all going to move away? Who would have known about the Flint water crisis? Like disasters happen. Things yeah. are unexpected. and. You have communities, you go to like Baltimore and you have whole blocks that are boarded up. Yeah. At one point, that was a thriving community. People bought those houses at market value yeah. and expected to keep them for, you know, for years to come. And now they had to walk away from them. Yeah. Uh, you've never had a situation where you bought a, an apartment complex and the area just started to go into decline? No. First deal I ever okay. bought. The first deal I was ever bought, what you're describing. But it was one house, dude. It didn't have any yeah. income. Like, like, nobody should be buying real estate in Detroit. You should, yeah. nobody should be buying real estate where there's snow. If there's snow on the ground, like, go south. Th those jobs are moving. Like, you people, when you invest money in real estate, you need to pay it like any business, like the tech business. Like, I don't know that I'd go invest a bunch of money in Ford Motor Company today. I think there's a better chance that Ford Motor Company goes away than stays. So, so I want to be around major hospitals, okay? Very, very hard to take a hospital down, like thriving hospitals, not, not, not just a hospital, but go, to, go, go get housing around um, major thriving hospitals. Even if you go to Baltimore, Detroit, I'll bet you there's some of that, some of that uh, urban tight around hospitals where nurses have to be, doctors have to be. They won't get rid of that completely, right? But on the outskirts of Detroit, man, they just got destroyed because the jobs left. Yeah. So when I go, I look at Houston, Texas. I look at Tampa, Orlando, Miami, uh, even the Mobile, Alabamas, the Atlanta, Georgias. All this migration is happening. And the more dumb shit that New York and New Jersey and California does, the more it just pushes all of these people to migrate to where there's a, a less tax burden. Yeah, I feel you. I mean, uh, we have a house in L.A. I mean, we, we rent, uh, but we're looking at Atlanta. <laughs> and yeah. taxes is one of the, the main reasons. Yeah. Ball, ball players it. are doing it. Uh, I guarantee you when LeBron moved to L.A., I guarantee he made a decision about taxes in his contract to say, hey, you got to offset this move. Right. Well, since last time you were here, I interviewed Dan Pena. Uh, are you familiar with Dan? Yeah, I know Dan. Um, he said he coached 25 billionaires over the, the course of his life, and he talked about some of the common traits. What do you think is consistent in terms of personality type? Oh, easy. First of all, 98% of the high performers on the planet have one thing in common. They're introverts. Bill Gates is an introvert. Warren Buffett's an introvert. Leon, uh, Elon Musk is an introvert. Blah, blah. Okay. Only 2% are loudmouth alpha males like me, okay? The only, but the, both the introverts and the uh, alpha males focus obsession, like OCD. I mean, laser beam focus. Yeah. They, they, you know, they would rather, there's a black hip hop guy, I forget his name, uh, that says, unless you want success like you want oxygen in your lungs, uh, the, uh, and I've been rich and I've been poor and there's no comparison, I mean, uh, uh, Elon, now he takes it back, he said uh, 15, 18 years ago, I would rather commit seppuku, which is Harry Carey, kill myself than be poor and not successful. Okay. So it's really the laser beam focused. Correct. Uh, from your point of view, what is the trait of a billionaire? Look, I, I've never coached any billionaires, so I, I hung out, I've hung out with one for about 90 days. Um, they, definitely, they definitely think about money differently. 
You know, there's almost this throwaway kind of like, okay, I'm not worried about that anymore. Um, did Dan name any of the, uh, the billionaires that he's coached? Uh, he, he did not, no. Yeah. It's a lot of billionaires, dude. I think there's only like, I mean, that means he's like, he's touched like, you know, a, a third or something of all the billionaires on the planet. Yeah. It's a lot of billionaires. Yeah. So, so, um, common traits, uh, successful, can do attitude. I'm going to figure this out. I'm not going to quit. Willing to go bankrupt. Not acting like middle class people. They never act like middle class. Like, they don't care where they live, dude. They're like, I live, I live wherever I gotta live. Um, dropouts, uh, courage, fucking never quit no matter what, willing to change and adapt. Don't listen to the common uh, everyday person. Uh, go into debt, dump their retirement accounts if they ever had one, like burn, burn the midnight oil, work a hundred hour weeks, yeah, I mean, you're basically listing out the, the things you mentioned in the 10X book. And uh, I, I want to get to that. But, hey, look, uh, I, didn't, I haven't coached them. billionaires, but, but I, I, read, I read about enough of them to say, hey, what is the common trait in these guys? You yeah. know, the Elon Musk talks about working 100 hours. Uh, yeah. Warren Buffett, study, he reads four hours a day. Look, I, if I go out, out on the street corner right now and ask people, hey, do you like to read books? Most of people would be like, oh, I don't have time to read. I don't like to read and I don't want to read. But here's the old man, third richest guy in the world, says, hey, I read four hours a day. Might be something people want to do if they haven't given up on their financial security. Right, right. I mean, my, my whole financial life is really based on Warren Buffett. And yeah. yeah I, try, I try to read as much as possible. Um, well, since our last interview, I, I did a little bit of research, and I found that you did an interview with Jordan Belfort. A. Yeah, yeah. A. The, wolf, the Wolf of Wall Street. And this turned into the equivalent of like a rap beef <laughs> with finance guys afterwards. Is that, is that a fair assessment of what happened? Well, he's not a finance guy. Well, I mean, a financial he, guy. He's not a financial guy. He's a fucking he criminal. Be. He's a okay. convicted criminal that didn't pay back the people he ripped off. And he's a fucking rat. On top of being a criminal, he's a rat turned on his own people to reduce his, uh, his time. So he's a criminal, ripped off a bunch of people, admits that he ripped off a bunch of people, never paid the people back and ratted, and ratted out his boys. So you can't give him, uh, dude, he, 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 he operates out of a little apartment with six interns. Did he 1099s? Hawking a $495 product. That don't sound like a banker to me. Yeah, I actually looked up his net worth uh, Z online. And yeah, minus 30 mi million. Minus 100 million. <laughs> well, minus 100 million. Yeah, you going to take advice from a guy that's fucking negative 100 million? Would you, sir? Your guy well, shooting you this. On, huh? I mean, you, you went on a show. Yeah, I did. Why? It was set up with my staff in Miami. It was, and it was a bad, probably a bad idea, but you know, I'm like, let me just go in there and fucking challenge him to a cage match. Well, uh, you said in the interview, he was talking about the real world. You said in your real world, everyone's using drugs. In my real world. In his real world, real world everyone's using drugs. Oh yeah. I mean, you saw that in the movie. Yeah. I mean, the whole movie is pretty much him, him being high the whole time. Dude, dude look, if um, there wasn't a movie about that, about his life story, we wouldn't know who the dude is. Like, what else is there? Is that is that your claim to fame? <laughs> you know? Yeah. I don't want that to yeah. be my legacy. Okay, I got 185 I employees. I'm trying to go to 1,000. He keeps asking me a question about how to sell a pen, and I'm like, dude, I, I'm over that story. Like you're 50 years old, you got to elevate the game at some point. Ask a new question. How do you buy a pen company? How do you replace a pen? How do you make sure a pen's never sold again on this planet? Elevate the game, son. Otherwise, you're going to die an old salesman. Mm. 
with a negative net worth of a minus 100 million. You put out an interview recently uh, on your own channel, and it was uh, one of your employees interviewing you? Yeah, Jared. Basically? That's my guy, Jared. Okay. Um, and part of the interview focused on your total net worth. And you pulled out various accounts and you know started going through various things. If you were to just take a step back and take a bird's eye view, what would you say your total net worth is? I don't know, man. Why? Why? I, like, it's crazy. It, 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 it's... What's it based on? Tell me what what net worth what, what would you say a net worth is based on? No, it's a tough one because I own a company and I I don't really know how much the company's worth. Right. I can look at what's in my investment account. I can look at certain assets like let's say jewelry or art and kind of add those together. Yeah. Yeah. But, but I mean, once you get to the companies, it becomes kind of fuzzy because you have to find a buyer for the company in yeah. order for it to be truly net worth. Yeah. And probably probably more buyers for the company than the art and the jewelry. Yeah. You know, so I don't know. I paid four hundred grand for the watch. It's probably worth two hundred today. So I know I'm worth at least two hundred grand because I paid cash for it. <laughs> That's a Richard Meal. Yeah, I probably go to Avi here. Probably give me half of what I paid for it. So yeah, I, certain watches. I, this, this is the whole argument about the net worth thing. Okay. Yeah, I know you're going to get a big headliner like Cardone talks about his net worth. Mm -hmm. It's great because people love that shit, dude. Yep. So. Um, Look, that sheet of paper I was looking at had a bunch of cash in it. I know that's real. That's real. I could go grab that. Uh, I know there's a couple of bags hidden around the world. You know, I could go grab the three bags. Um, there's some guns and ammo. I know where that stuff is. There's 1,500 accounts receivables from companies that I could, I could go to a bank and borrow against. There's 6,500 apartments with addresses and tenants. So 6,500 times $1,800, I don't know, that's 11 or 12 million bucks a month. It's worth something to somebody. Plus the, the real estate, uh, what? My wife's over here doing math for me. <laughs> She's counting on her fingers too, by the way. <laughs> so, you know, I got my wife and my kids, man. I got my brand. I don't even know what my good, my, my brand is. Like Jordan Belfort, his, his net worth, based on his brand, that, that he stole money from people, that fucking, that costs you everything in the future. No major company would ever hire a, a convicted criminal. Okay, I've worked for some of the biggest companies on the planet. Morgan Stanley's hired me. Like, why? Because my brand's good. So I don't know what my goodwill is. If I quit cursing and quit taking on other people and, and, and punching people out in the face on YouTube, I'd probably have a better brand. <laughs> You know, um, you know, the fact that I put 35,000 people in an event last year in Miami, you know, that gives people a lot of confidence about my ability to fill out a stadium. Yeah. Congrats on that. That's yeah. big. Yeah. I should have That's you big. speak there one year, man. I got you whenever you want. Okay. And there's a lot of, a lot of stories about Scientology. There's documentaries, there's, there's, you know, just a lot of information that's going back since like the eighties. Uh, what made you become a Scientologist? I read the book Dianetics when I was uh, 25 years old, right out of a treatment center. And that book helped me understand why I was using drugs so much and actually helped me in my recovery process. Uh, then I went and did, uh, when I was 45 years old, I actually had a, an experience uh, because of a friend of mine that had been studying Scientology. He was a bond trader. And he was one of the most successful bond traders in the United States. And I'm like, hey, what, what, you know, what, you seem different, dude, than, than everybody else I meet. And he's like, well, if you want to know what it is, I'll tell you. I said, well, what, what is it? He said, it's Scientology. I said, well, where is it? When is it? And, and how can I get some of it? And uh, 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 at that time, the only thing I had done at that time was read the book Dianetics. And I was living in San Diego at the time. He was living in Houston. Uh, I got an appointment to go to the church in San Diego. Sat, uh, went in there, asked them, hey, what do you do here exactly? Forget the media, the CNN, the tabloids. Uh, it didn't matter to me that John Travolta and Tom Cruise were Scientologists. That meant nothing to me. Like, I didn't give a shit. I'm like, all, all I wanted to know, what can you guys do for me? And the guy looked at me and says, w what do you want to handle? 
What do you want to handle with your life? And at that time, I was 45 years old. I, had a, I was single. I wanted a wife. I wanted kids. That wasn't happening. I was not, I was not in a good place to, to, to be a family man. I, 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 didn't, I was scared of it. I was actually terrified of that kind of commitment. Uh, I owned three businesses at the time. I had a little bit of money, but I didn't know what to do with the money. Okay, this was just 15, 16 years ago. So if you look at the trajectory of my life since I was 45 years old, you're going to see like it's going to be slowly going upward and then all of a sudden straight up. And I have been there now for 15 years. I've done courses, books, uh, auditing, a thing called auditing that has given me so much uh, peace in my life, so much more confidence, personal confidence. I used to be scared of everything. I don't have that anymore. Well, when you look to some of the documentaries about Scientology, uh, you go into certain different levels, right? And there is a highest level that you could achieve. And the thing that I found kind of a bit strange, uh, that based on L. Ron Hubbard's writings, is that at the highest level, he reveals something called Xenu. And I'll go ahead and read this. So, yeah, uh, yeah, Xenu, dude, you, 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 according you, to Scientology, you know, uh, it's all, it's all, it's ridiculous. I, I, right. It's a, I'm just telling you, I, you want to know, do you want to know, million. <laughs> do you want to know right. from me? Yeah. Most people are having trouble with yesterday and today. So you're, you're going to read off some crazy, unbelievable shit that nobody cares about because they're worried about their families today, their kids today, their bills today, and their future tomorrow. So I didn't go there to handle anything about fucking trillions of years ago. I seem like a pretty, pretty fucking uh, practical guy. I care about taking care of my wife, my kids, and my life. And I don't go to the media or the tabloids. And I don't fucking Google shit to find out what it is. I listened to a guy that was a very successful bond trader. Say, hey, man, this helped me make good decisions day to day. And I'm going to tell you, I've been down there 16 years. Half the shit I've seen on the Internet about Scientology, 90% of the shit I've seen on, on the Internet about Scientology is complete fucking garbage. It's helped me in my life personally. I have a beautiful marriage, two beautiful kids. I'm a good father today. I'm dependable. I had three employees, dude, when I walked in there. Okay, I got 185 in Miami. I got another 150 in the real estate. I owned a handful of houses, of, of apartments uh, in when I was in San Diego. Maybe 200 units. I own 6,500 a day. So it's been a game changer for me. That's all I can tell you. Now, if people want to get their information from Google and some documentary, like the, the doc documentary they did of uh, Michael Jackson. Somebody asked me if I watched that. I said, why would I watch a guy who can't defend himself? I'm not going to watch that. I'm not going to watch one side of a story. Well, has Scientologists ever made a, a documentary to respond to all that? Yeah, Scientology. it's called Scientology TV. Okay, there you go. Okay, so you feel that Scientology is one of the keys to your success? Not... not Dude, I, 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 would give, I would give what I've done there. There's $19 course. I'm doing a finance course they have there right now. It's $19. Uh, that When I read that, that finance course, on the way down to New York, by the way, it took me maybe three hours to do the whole course. You can do it online. Uh, I went to accounting. I spent five years to get an accounting degree. I learned more in this little course, little course pack this big that I learned in five years of college. Hey man, if it worked for you, I'm all for it. I'm all for it. Your wife is a Scientologist also? Yes, she is. Okay, your kids? Uh, well, they're eight and 10, so that'll be up to them. Okay. So let's talk about your book, uh, The 10X Rule, which actually, I actually owned that book before we did the interview and I didn't even remember that that you was- You didn't know it was me, huh? I didn't know it was you. It was, you know, as I was, I, I do books by Audible. I do uh, audio books. That, that's my thing. I was with um, them this morning. Yep. I mean, because I, I, I'm able to, to read books at like 
2 or 2.5 speed. So yeah. I could just kind of whiz through them really quickly. So, I mean, very interesting book. How many copies have you sold so far of that? Of this I, book? I don't know. I think the audio downloads and the video far exceed the uh, books, though. Okay. But it's been a New York Times bestseller and everything. I don't know if that book hit the... I, I know uh, if you're not first or last, it's on the New York Times bestsellers list. I don't know if the 10X rule hit the list. You know, it's a weird list when to hit that. It, it's only a, over a, 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 the opening week. Ah, okay. Well, you had, you had some interesting points in it. You had uh, like four common mistakes. Uh, the first one is setting your sights too low. I remember Richard Branson said something similar. That he basically says, look, if your goal is to make 100000 this year, make your goal a million. You may not hit the million, but you'll probably surpass the 100000 Yeah. Is that pretty much what you're saying? Yeah, the, 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 the basis is, is that because we underestimate challenges and things that are going to happen, uh, disappointments and discouragements, because we miscalculate the downside and the, the struggle, uh, most people come up short on their targets. And I believe, and I think Richard was saying the same thing here, is that if you just if you just literally come up with a different target, 10 times bigger target, just as an arbitrary number, if you picked a target 10 times bigger, number one, you will have a different plan to achieve a million than you would a hundred. And number two, you will probably exceed your original goal by many, even though you come up short on the million. Well, you also talk about people underestimate how much action is required and spending too much time competing, not enough time dominating their sector. Explain that. So, look, I, I made this mistake for 20 years, by the way. That book and all the books that I've read is me trying to solve a problem. I'm trying to solve my own problems. And the 10X rule was I was, at that time, uh, I'd been in business for 20 years, kept struggling, working hard, doing all the right things, but could not get ahead. Literally could not find a way to get ahead of the game and felt like I was always a little behind, not sure about what I was doing. Um, so the premise there is I, I, was, I was calculating what it would take to get me in a, in a place. When you're trying to do this, when you're trying to build anything, you're, you're, you're doing it for the first time. There's not a lot of direction or guidance around you. And so I'm looking around at other people as my measurement, if you will. Hey, how am I doing compared to them? And I was doing better than most other people, so I thought I was doing good, but it still didn't get me the freedom I wanted. And so I said, what is the repeated mistake I keep making? And it was I was competing with the guys on the side of me. I was comparing myself to their movement. And when I finally dropped that and said, hey, I'm going to go dominate this space. I'm going to own it until I'm going to spend more I'm going to be in more places. I'm going to do what they won't do until at which point they will surrender some of their turf to me. So the concept of there is dominate the space. Don't just compete with the people uh, at, at your level. Well, in the book, you also said you either accomplish your goals and dreams or you'll be used to accomplish someone else's goals and dreams. Yeah, that's true. You, you, you know, if you're, you're, you're either working somebody else's dreams, which is nothing wrong with that. You got to help somebody else. You can't make your own dreams come true if you can't make somebody else's come true. But true. but if if you're not dreaming, right? If you're not dreaming about how to be better, how to excel, how to find another level, then you're going to get stale in your job anyway, and you're going to be used up in that space like a like a clog in a wheel. You just be consumed by the system. So the person that is always valuable in the system of the economic system is the person that's continually to create out-create, and then uh, deliver more than they promised whoever they're around, whether it's an investor, uh, the boss, until at which point the, the boss or the investor says, hey, let's give you a new position here. Well, Nick Cannon, who's a regular guest on my show, and uh, you know he's worth hundreds of millions of dollars, a bunch of successful projects one after another. And we were kind of debating uh, in our last interview about people hustling and so forth and, and people being bosses and this, that. And he said, well, Vlad, you got to realize not everyone's a hustler. Some people just want to pay their bills and die. 
I believe in hustling. I believe like, okay, look. Facts. And everybody doesn't have and, that and, hustler yeah. spirit. And you know, just because some people I, are designed to be you, you worker ha- ants. Right. You you have you Everybody's have runs. A soldier. I had a great run as a DJ. At one point I realized, hey, I'm getting too old for this shit. I right. can't I can't I'm not gonna keep supporting myself by doing these club gigs and so yeah. forth. It's time for me to switch up and do something completely different. Yeah. And that's where the, the videos you cut and the from movies... from a different cloth. Like, everybody doesn't have that ingenuity. Yeah, so I, I respect hustlers. I, I, don't, I don't respect people you know, but who, you The, the majority and... of the world, that middle class that we were talking about, they're employees. Uh, I would say that's the majority of the world. Wouldn't you say? I was having this conversation today. I ask myself this all the time. I, I think... I think most people have given up on the game. Hmm. What do you I, mean? Well, I think I think most people. I think, I think, a lot of people that hate on the game right now have given up on it. That's why they hate on it. I don't want to play anymore. It's like the child that throws down the checkerboard. I'm getting beat so bad, I I, I can't play. So I throw the game away. And I think people are doing that with money now. You know. I mean, look look at the stat that you gave earlier about one percent of the people literally owning more than the entire middle class combined. You know, when you're doing all the right things, and I can relate to this because I watched my mom do all the right things, save the money, pay, paid for the house, paid the house off, paid the cars off, never stole from anybody, you know, planned for retirement. She was still terrified every month. Are they going to stop my Medicare? Are they going to stop the Social Security? Is the health care plan going to change? Uh, is my cash being invested right? Like she was terrified. So at some point you're like, I give up, you know, or, or we try to vote. We try to vote for the right president to somehow solve our problems. And this isn't an American issue, but this happens. We're in Brazil. Same thing goes on there. I go to, I go to Dubai. They're, they're worried about the same things in Dubai. So I think a lot of people have given up on the idea they can change their condition in life and and therefore they end up doing too little or just enough to keep a job and to be used by the system. Yeah. I mean, when you look at these historical low unemployment rates, what I honestly feel is just skewing these numbers a lot is the whole gig culture of like Uber, Lyft, uh, Postmates, whatever else, you have all these people that are technically employed. And I remember, uh, you know, a comedian named T.K. Kirkland. He's a regular on my show. We had a debate about Uber, and he goes, he said he claims that he knows guys that are making two thousand dollars a week driving for Uber. If you do an Uber Eats and Uber driving, and you're making two thousand a week. Because you're putting in the hours. And two thousand. I don't know anyone who makes two thousand. Oh, I know. A company makes about two thousand a week, sir. Really? Oh, absolutely. I, I have. No, how many hours a day do they work? They have to work a lot. Seven days a week. Seven days a week, but they coming home with two thousand dollars a week. Okay, I got it. So that's eight grand. So my point is, it's a lot of work. But me and you understand what I'm about to say. Where? What's your plan? And I'm like, okay, you got to be literally working 12 hour days, seven days a week to be making 2000 a week uh, driving Uber. And, you know, don't even count the wear and tear on your car and the gas and and everything else like that. It's not really 2000 a week, but you have all these people that have these jobs and they're scraping by. They feel like they're bosses because they don't have to punch in, but they have a job that has no trajectory at all. If you work at Uber for two years, you will not be made a manager. Dude, dude Uber's <laughs> will, spending a billion dollars, losing a billion dollars a year, trying to figure out how to get rid of the drivers. Right. Exactly. So, so exactly. I'm totally with you on this. First of all, 3.5% can't get much lower. Number two, wages haven't changed in America. They have not changed. Like, like literally, if you, look at the, if you look at a graph on wages, they're almost flat. Little blip lately. But but yeah. but still not enough not enough to think that gravity's not going to pull that number down again. You got the farm the uh, farm payrolls are getting hammered because of wages. Um, da- uh, d- the dairy business is off because people aren't drinking you know they're li- lactose intolerant now. So the milk the the farmers are going out of business over there. Those are real jobs. Uh, 
if Uber gets rid of drivers, like, like Uber got rid of taxi cabs and their drivers, uh, at least uh, in every, every, other, every other city but New York, um, if, the, if the unemployment goes to 5% from the 35 that's a 30% increase. There's going to be a lot of people hurting in America. Well, I don't think it's if Uber gets rid of drivers, it's when Uber that's right. gets rid of drivers. Yeah. I, I own a Tesla and I use auto drive every day. Now that's not fully autonomous, but it's really just one step away. Yeah, it's already yeah. being done and I use it every day. Right? Yeah, and people are in denial about this, Vlad, you know that. Yeah. Like they're, 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 there's gonna be tremendous automation in the next years to come that's gonna replace jobs. 100%, 100%. Now you, you talked about in the book you said you have to be obsessed. Nobody has ever accomplished something incredible without obsession. And you said the ability to be obsessed is not a disease, it is a gift. Yeah. And I, I can tell you, uh, I took a, a vacation with my family. Uh, for, it was like my first vacation in like three years. And even though I was supposed to be on vacation, every morning I would log in and the internet was bad where I was, but it didn't matter. <laughs> I logged in and I worked every morning and, and slipped in some work throughout the day because I'm completely obsessive about my business. Yeah. It's not, it's not that I have to do it. It's that I want to do it. Yeah. And uh, this is what you're talking about, I assume. Yeah. And, and you, can't, you can't name a person that you and I both can share their names. Nick Cannon. I know Nick. I mean, I don't know Nick, but I know of Nick because Nick must be obsessed. Yeah. And, and uh, like all the greats, just go back all the way through time. These people become obsessed with their mission. And this is what's missing from the quitters. The people that you talked about earlier, they checked out on the game. They threw the checkerboard down. They're like, I, I quit, man. I can't win the money game. So, so I'm not going to be obsessed with it. The wealthy are obsessed with their wealth. Not for the money, man. Not for the money, but for the game. And, and uh, people that want success. Elon Musk is obsessed with this electric thing. He, he doesn't care if it makes money. He doesn't even care if he's in the car business 20 years from now. He wants to change the game. Yeah, and the SpaceX thing. Let's not forget that. Yeah, yeah. Whatever he's doing, he wants, he wants to change the game. Everyone has that Musk in them, by the way. Like everybody has the genius in them. Everybody has a Steve Jobs. Everybody's got an Oprah. Everybody's got a Mother Teresa in them. And, and the more I can like be obsessed with whatever my little gift is. Well, yeah, I remember I interviewed um, Scott Adams. He's the artist behind the cartoon Dilbert. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Right, Th this, is, this has been... Uh, a mainstay in the newspaper world for decades at this point. You know, very, uh, you know, rich guy. I went to, you know, really nice house, has money and so forth. And he kind of broke it down. You know, he had a bunch of New York Times bestselling books on top of it. And he kind of broke it down in an interesting type of fashion that people, people will say, well, you're going to be successful in something you're really passionate at. And you have to find your passion. But, but he kind of said, well, you know, you're passionate about the things that do well yeah. and make you money yeah. and people seem to like. You yeah. become more passionate as more energy builds around these things. Yeah. Like You said that passion is actually overrated. Yeah, so if, if you talk to a billionaire, uh, as often happens, when a billionaire gets interviewed, somebody's gonna say, what was your secret to success? And what do these billionaires always say? Whether it's uh, Warren Buffett, Mark Zuckerberg, um, Richard Branson, they all say the same thing. They say passion. Follow your passion. That's, that's what makes everything work. Here's the problem with that. Think what else they could have said instead of that answer. Mm -hmm. Could they say, well, I'm a billionaire because I'm smarter than poor people? Right. You can't say that, even if it's true. Right. Because in those, at least two of those guys, that might be true. <laughs> right? You know, Buff Buffett and Zuckerberg are way smarter than ordinary people. Yeah. They can't say, I worked hard because their gardener works harder than they do, right? It's not helping them become a billionaire. So if you look at all the answers they can actually give, they can't say luck, because then nobody wants to work with them. It's like, well, you just got lucky once. Like, <laughs> you know, what are the odds that happens again? Yeah. So they say the only democratic thing they can say, passion. And you know why they say that? Because they think you think you can get that. 
you could just be so passionate about something when no one cares about it and it's literally making no, no money. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? Oh, totally. And, like, like it's yeah. ridiculous. It's ridiculous. It's it's bad. It's bad advice for people to follow their passions. Like, yeah. Just because just because you're passionate about something. I was on a I was on a show recently and and this kid goes into his pitch about his business and why he loves it. And he loves this idea. And I'm like, yeah, bro, it doesn't matter if you love it. If nobody else needs it, wants it, or will pay for it, it don't matter. Yeah. And I almost feel that knowing when to quit is more important than knowing not to quit because well, you could very easily just keep hammering your head for years on something that's never going to go anywhere. But to be able to just say, look, I'm cutting my losses. This is going nowhere. Yeah. I'm going to go focus on something else is extremely important. More important, I feel. Yeah, that's not quitting, though. That's all that's doing is moving, is mo shifting your obsession from this thing's not working, shifting that obsession and that energy and that massive action to a channel that can work. And everybody right. is required to make a shift along the way. The vehicle you start on will not be the vehicle you arrive on. Right, because you said your career should be a religious mission. Yeah, and it, and I should I should go through a series of of evolutions, so that I'm not you know I might I, I might not show up on a horse if I started in 1800. Yeah, I mean when you look at Vlad TV, we are here to document culture and important figures during this time for generations to come. This is what we do. So for example, one of my favorite actors was John Witherspoon. He starred in the Friday movies and the boondocks and so forth. I interviewed him last year and it was basically like a, a documentary about his life. He told his life story from beginning to end. He passed away a few weeks ago. And this is the only piece, the only interview he has where he actually tells about his life. There's wow. been other interviews. He's talked about his movies here and there, but to say, here's where I was born. Here's how I grew up. This is how I got my first break. Here's how my career progressed. Here's where I am now. This is why I'm still working at 76 years old and so forth. That doesn't exist outside of this Vlad TV interview. And this is really like what I feel is the religious mission of what we're trying to do. So I don't really care how much money gets made right now. I don't care whether people like it, don't like it. There's a, there's a higher mission in what, yeah. what we're trying to do here. And I feel that most successful people, this is what they do. Yeah. And, and then you got to find some things that pay the bills in the meantime. So right. the fact that you're doing that, nobody else is going to do it because the networks can't do that TV because they feel like it's too promotional to an individual. And and the fact that you're doing that, man, one, it's going to, it's going to provide, long-term value to, to, to society. And number two, people should get behind you and support you. Look, I'm the one that said, Hey, I'm coming back to New York. Let's meet up because I do know you add value. Yeah. I mean, I looked it up almost 4 million people combined watched our last interview. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Pretty big numbers. It's a lot of people, man. It, yeah. And, and you know, when you look at Successful people. I like, grew up in a town of 40,000, Vlad, so that's like 100x. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> when you look at the most successful people, their the more successful someone is, the longer their timeline is. Meaning that when you look at the, the millionaires and the billionaires, they're looking at what happens past their lifetime. Yeah. When you look at the middle class, they might think a year or two in advance. And when you look at the, the lower class, they're trying to make it to next week. Would that be a, a fair a fair assessment based on what you saw? Uh, you know, I remember when I was worried about one night. So I remember when I couldn't, I'm like, oh, am I going to be able to pay the rent this month? I was 23 years old. Am I going to be able to pay the rent? Am I going to be late again? And then I remember when I was 25 thinking, okay, I, am I, I, I think I'm going to actually make 100 grand this year. And I was starting to think in years now. And so, again, that goes back to that evolution thing. You know, now, now it's like, wow, what are people going to know me for? They're going to know me for the money I made or they're going to know me because I was a good dude. I didn't rip anybody off. You know, I had a great career, employed a bunch of people. They felt good about it. 
uh, that, that I left some advice on this planet. And, and I, so I think you're right. The, 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 the more you get away from money problems, the more you're able to look into the future. And this is why Steve Jobs, at the end of Steve Jobs' career, he says money doesn't matter. But that's not what he was saying when he was trying to freaking put some money together. Right. When he was trying to keep Apple in the game, he went to, he went to his, his, at that time, enemy, okay, which was Bill Gates, and said, Bill, I need to, we need to do a deal. I need to borrow some money. So here's a guy that had to put away a lifelong grudge to keep his thing in play. He had to sell a little part of his soul so that he could be the Steve Jobs and, and make Apple the, the company he knew it could be. Uh, and he had to give up on this old idea, uh, one, that he wouldn't, use, he wouldn't depend on his old adversary, and number two, that he would give up the idea that Apple would always be just this piece of hardware. And that's when iPhone happened. You know, he hung in there. So these these people don't quit. You know, when you're worried, when you're just when you're just like I'm paying bills this week, you've quit on the dream. And this this is what people in all countries can't afford to do right now. No matter how hard it gets, you can't quit on the little bit of dream you got, the little bit of light you got on your dream. Because I'm proof right now that anybody, if you don't quit, if you don't quit, if you don't screw people over. If you don't rip people off, if you add more value, if you keep showing up and you keep, you know, learning from the right people and you don't throw the towel in and you can do anything you want, that, that is still true today, regardless of how bad it is for you right now at this moment. Well, you had a video called Five Steps to Becoming a Millionaire. Can you break down those five steps? Man, I don't know if you, if you held me to them right now. I don't know if I could. Uh, I think I probably, probably number one is do the math. Or number one, make a commitment to be a millionaire. Number two, do the math. Okay, you basically just break down 20 years into a into million dollars. That's uh, 50,000 a year. Most people are going to make 50 grand this year. Median income in America is $59,000. So if you're only making 35, it's going to take you 30 years. So uh, do the math. And then figure out, hey, how can I shorten this period of time up? Because I do not want to be a millionaire or make a million dollars over the next 50 years. I want to see if I can shut that down into like 10 years. I don't need it to be get rich quick. I need it to be, hey, I'm going to get rich at some time in my life. I don't want to be so old that I can't enjoy it. And I want to be able to take care of the people around me that I love and care for. So I think the last step was just stay with the deal. Don't give up on it. But you might know the five steps better than I do. I've dropped a lot of video. <laughs> right. Well, you've said in your book, um, hold on a second, let me let me find this. Okay. Well, you said in your book, no one will save you or make you successful. And I think that's one of the, the big misconceptions out there. Is people feel like, you know, if I could just meet that right person, if I could just do that right pitch, because I see a lot of it, you know, in a lot of the comments, it's like, how does someone raise money to buy a multi-unit property who's making $10 an hour? And it, 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 you look at this and you go, okay, this is, this is not a realistic question. You don't. <laughs> no, making... there is an answer to it. You don't, bro. Not making $10 an hour. Yeah. Like, like my, my dilemma, when I bought my first deal, I had the money. See, people don't even know all the right questions to ask. Me and Damon John talk about this all, all the time. Most people don't even know the right questions to ask. It just shows you the schools are teaching people nothing. Like, like why, why isn't there a class on what are the right questions to ask someone if you only make $10 and you want to be in real estate? The right question to ask is who the fuck do you partner with to do a deal? How can you ask about, how can you add value to somebody that has money that wants to buy deals? The first guy that I did apartments with, he had no money. He was 53 years old with less than 50 bucks in a bank account. I let him tag on deals for me because I needed a manager. I had the deals and I had the money. I didn't have the time to manage the property and I did not have the, the natural inclination or skill set to manage real estate. Meaning, meaning I didn't want to collect rents. I didn't want to fix units. I, I'm no good with a hammer, hammer right? I, I don't know what the plumbing problem is. I just, I don't know any of that stuff. So I gave him an equity position in the apartments to run, manage, take care of, 
the properties. The deal was don't steal from me. If you steal from me or rip me off, uh, then you're not going to get your piece. And I gave him a piece of equity when we sold. That guy made millions of dollars tagging along with me. So he made me rich and I made him richer. It was a symbiotic relationship where we both benefited. So that's what the guy that has 10 bucks should be looking, looking to do rather than, rather than what his comment was, which was just another fucking quitter. How am I going to ever do this with only $10? You ain't. Particularly because you got a bad attitude and only $10. Well, yeah. I mean, a lot of people say, I've got all these great ideas, but no one to invest in them. And my response is always, if you really believe in your ideas, you could start small. You're just waiting to fuck up someone else's money. <laughs> That's what you're really saying. Yeah. You want to mess up someone else's money because you don't want to mess up your own money. But the reality is, Vlad TV was started in a bedroom with you know, the few dollars I had in my bank account. Uh, I did everything. I held the camera. I did the interviews. I edited the videos. I mailed, emailed them out. I did the marketing. I did the uploads. Uh, when I first had an employee, you know, I would pay them myself. Like it all just started by just pouring money back into the company and just scraping by until you could, you could keep, uh, yeah. How many growing. views, how many views in your first video? I don't know, 20, 30, like nothing, yeah. nothing. No, no one saw the vision in the beginning. And, and people said, I remember the goal was, okay, we're going to drop a new exclusive video seven days a week, 365 days a year. And everyone said, that's, that's stupid. No one wants to watch that many videos. Just drop one, one a week or one a month and that'll be fine. These days we drop six videos a day, yeah. plus a flashback and a full interview sometimes. So that's sometimes eight videos a day. And honestly, I could double that if I could. I just, you know, for me, the hardest part of my business is hiring and building a staff. Yeah. That's always been the hardest. That, that's been the hardest part for Vlad TV. It's not the content, it's not the audience, it's the hiring and the managing. Uh, but the reality is, is that you can't really overexpose yourself. It's impossible. Yeah. We, we live in a, we live in a, like, you, 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 Vlad TV can compete with Fox News today. I think we do compete with Fox News. If you look at their YouTube channel, I think that our videos probably consistently get more views than Fox News. Yeah. So, I mean, Fox Business, Fox Business, the junior to, the, to, to their network, you, you know, you probably get more views every day than they get with eyeballs. And they got tens of millions of dollars invested in there in 20, 25 or 30 years of a brand and major piece of real estate in New York. So not to mention what you do to MSNBC and CNN. Yeah, I mean, we and then when you get good numbers. guests like me, then you just fucking you tear it off the charts. Yeah, man. I mean, we we get more. I look at ESPN's numbers on YouTube. We we blow those numbers away. Uh, this is a completely. It's not. It's not a business with a bunch of VC money behind it. It's all just basically taking the profits, putting it back in, and, and trying to grow it. Uh, so that's really the message to everyone that's waiting for someone to come save them. Just start it yourself. Or just because go. I think that the, rather than looking for an investor, go sell go go sell the product to somebody before it's finished. If you right. can't sell it to somebody, you know. And and what I find somewhat silly in terms of a lot of the messages I get is, "Hey, I was I want to start a business like yours. Can you mentor me?" Yeah. And you go to their page as a private page with with no business, and it's like insane. Why would I waste my time on someone who hasn't even started yet? As opposed to, hey, look, I've been working this business for two years. And I got up to this point. Can you help me out? And yeah. it's like, yeah, sure. I could bring you. I mean, we've interviewed other media companies. You know, we brought in like the people like Adam 22 from No Jumper or Sean Cotton from Say Cheese TV. We, we try to give back to people that are hustling, but I'm not going to waste my time with someone who hasn't even started yet. But, but Vlad, you know, the guy, the guy had started. He's got a social media channel that's private. <laughs> like, like, why do you, why, why are you on social media if you're private? Do you look at that much porn that you don't want your <laughs> girlfriend to see? It, it seems like the real estate market has been slowing down for the past, I would say, year and a half. Would you say that's accurate or no? What kind of real estate are you talking about? Uh, residential real estate. Uh, houses? Single, you mean houses? Yeah, single family homes. Yeah, they ought to just die. 
Yeah. There you go. I'm just trying to get, I, I want all the housing in America to go away. So I turn everybody into a renter. Yeah. Dude, this not, the reason, the reason is you got, you got 70 million people in America. Don't that the, 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 the 70 million baby boomers that don't need to own a home. They've already owned one. They want to go on a vacation now. They're, they're, they're moving into retirement, into the golden age. It, it, you know, they're not going to have a house. They're going to die. They're, they're, what's going to happen in the next 20 years is you're going to have millions of houses uh, find their way through the system because mama or daddy, the last living, is going to die in the house that nobody, the kids don't want. The two kids are going to say, what do we want to do with this? And Mike's going to say to John, sell it. Okay, good. When do we sell it, says John. Mike says, as fast as we can. They put it on the market. They get an offer next Friday. They say, let's sell this thing. We don't even care what we get. Because anything they get is 100% more than they had, divided by two, which is 50% each. So they, 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 All they want is their money, dude. That means that house has no bottom to it. So number one, you got half of America, the, 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 the owners of homes that are getting too old. And then you got this young 89 million baby, uh, 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 gen, uh, um, millennials that are like, I have no interest in owning a home. I want to travel. I want to be mobile. So you got half of America, 150 million strong that are like, I have less uh, propensity to own a home than not. And then you got an economy that, if it softens up at all, uh, will kill housing. Yeah, yeah. Like I've always said, uh, I've got an apartment in New York, and I got a house in Calabasas, and both of them are rented, and I have absolutely no problems with that whatsoever. None. None. And uh, we had one place in New York. We kept it for about a year and a half. We realized we didn't like it. When that lease was over, we just up and moved. It was that easy. Bank of America rents. Wells Fargo rents. They rent, man. They rent. They rent where they work. Yep. And they lend money out to people that will buy where they live. <laughs> well, in in the ten x book, you talked about getting an unfair advantage. Can you explain what that is? You 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 want to put yourself in a position at the table where you can win. So <clears throat> you got you got to assess the other players at the table. What will they do? What will they not do? You know, it's not about the cards you have. It's about how to play the cards you have. And the way to play the cards I have is to find out what will the other guy do or not do. So, you know, the, the fact that you're doing Vlad TV, what you're covering, you know the networks won't cover it. So it gives you an unfair advantage. Mm. Uh, me buying real estate that I can close on without checking with a board like Blackstone has to go to a board to get every approval on a deal at $100 million. I, I don't need to check with anybody. It gives me an unfair advantage against an institution that has, they have a thousand times more money than I do. So everybody, as long as you hadn't quit, as long as you hadn't thrown the towel in, you can, as long as you're creative and committed, can figure out what your competitive unfair advantage is. Is this similar to what Warren Buffett calls an economic moat? Yeah, I think are it you, is. Are you familiar with that? Yeah. That yeah. term? Like for, yeah. for example, an economic the way he defines it is when you have a product that has some sort of value to its customers where a competitor can't lower their price yeah. and steal your customers. Like for example, Nike is a good example. Yeah. That. It doesn't matter if Adidas says, hey, well, Adidas is actually a good competitor, but let's just say if New Balance said, hey, all of our shoes are 10% lower than Nike's, people will still buy Nike's. Yeah. Is that basically what you're talking about? Yeah, yeah. The moat would be like like in real estate, since you were, you brought up real estate. Uh, you know, one one house, a house doesn't have a lot of moat around it, like a lot of protection, right? When, when I buy 300 units, it's got a swimming pool that's $4 million, a theater, uh, security, lighting, leasing agents. We take care of people, um, doggy park. Those are moats. Very, very difficult mm. to replace. Um, even if the economy pulls back, you're still going to want some of those things like security. Even, even the social environment, having 300 tenants on 30 acres. 
uh, that people can actually have community with one another for 1800 bucks a month. Very, very difficult to replace that at a single family home where you have probably no fence, no wall. Wall is a bad word right now, I know. No fence, uh, no pool, no security, uh, definitely no social community uh, to tap into. So those are moats, right? You want to protect your business. Vlad TV's got a moat. It's got, it's got this brand. Hey, I'll deliver eight videos a day. Some, some people can't do that. And, and, and so sometimes a moat isn't just um, Apple. It's got a big moat around it. Uh, but, but work ethic can be a moat. So my, yeah. mo my, my, my uh, ability to both my willingness to spend money, million dollars a month in advertising and to probably generate another $8 million in organic advertising uh, builds a tremendous moat around me and my brand and my companies for other people can't just come take it from me because they, they can't replace easily what that other company or you are doing. So you spend a million dollars a month in advertising. Yeah, I'd like to get to a million a week. Mm. All right, because I think after doing our interviews and started to post them on the site, I actually saw Grant Cardone banners <laughs> on my website. That's good. Uh, did yeah. you did you so, click them? <laughs> I did. Good. I did. You paid for that. That's <laughs> all good. You paid for those. Clicks. I try to waste as much money as possible in advertising. Yeah, that's always been the challenge for Vlad TV. We've never done any advertising at all. Yeah. We we felt that it should all be organic, but. You know, when you look at the big boys, none of them are doing this. Dude, all the big boys spent. One of the questions I had when I announced that we're doing this interview, someone said, what can poor people do to break the cycle of poverty? Number one, you got to know that you can break the cycle. You, the, the, the first most important thing is you have to make a decision on breaking this cycle. You know, I wasn't born rich. Uh, I, saw, I, saw, I was born into the middle class. I realized it did not work. It's a broken system. The middle class is almost as painful as poverty. Constant fear. And so the way to break it is you have to, number one, make a decision. I'm breaking the cycle. And number two, I need to study people that have broken the cycle. Uh, like you just said about the, uh, you don't advertise. Okay, well, you can brag about it, but it's not a good idea. Right. Nobody in the history of the world ever became big not advertising. Like, you should be wasting money on, ad, on, on, on ads. Everybody should know about Vlad TV. You, you, already got a, dude, you already got a base of people that want to talk it up for you. you, know, you you've already churned up all this hate. Like, how many years you've been doing this? Uh, we're going into our 12th year. Yeah, you got 12 years of putting up with bullshit and, and negative comments. Like, all that is energy because now they know your name. That's all they ever remember is the name. Um, so, so if you threw, if you threw money at that now, the bonfire will just spread. And that's a mistake that I made, Vlad. Uh, the first 20 years I was in business before I started doing the Scientology, I was too scared to spend money. It was me, go out, get money, keep money for self, go out and get some more money, keep it for myself, go out and keep it, put it in a retirement account, plan for when I'm going to get off the cycle. I'm going to get off the treadmill. I know my deal is coming to an end soon, so I got to hoard my money. I was terrified. The more money I got, the more scared I got of money. I did not know how to use money. And then, you know, once I started removing some of my blocks, some of this, what'd you call it? Poverty, thinking, scarcity. What did you call it? Uh, well, the cycle of poverty. Yeah, the cycle of poverty. It, I was stuck in the cycle of poverty even though I had money. Like I know, I know people, I grew up around people that had millions of dollars that, that would steal cash in for food stamps. And we go to Macy's every year and get a new card under another name to get a 15% discount. That is a poverty mentality, regardless of your bank account. And so number one, make a decision to break it. Number two, you got to start studying people, you got to start studying people that have broken the cycle, the chains. Bill, Go Bill Gates, was uh, he was born but to, to a wealthy family, but he broke the cycle of his dad's poverty thinking. His dad was just a rich doctor. His dad was nowhere, nowhere near the position that Bill Gates has put himself into because Bill had a much 
a, a much bigger, wider think about his responsibility on this planet. Right, because after our interview, after we started posting, I think the first part, and you talked about how when your dad died, he left an insurance policy, a life insurance policy that your mom cashed out. Everyone's like, "Oh, see, this is that bullshit." See, this guy started out with with, an ins- with, a, with a big, big insurance, uh, you know, payout. He didn't start from the bottom. You can't compare us to this guy. He had a huge leg up over everybody. And it's like, well, okay, maybe you got a little bit of money. No, dude, no, 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 dude. I didn't get any of that money. I was ten well, years he, old. He's just saying in general, your family. Yeah, but my, yeah, we had enough money for my mom to feed us. So if you don't have enough money to eat, man, okay, I had one leg up on you. I mean, I had a bicycle too, so maybe I got you. I I really got a fuck on you. I had a bicycle with air in the tires. Uh, I had a twenty-two rifle back back in Lake Charles, Louisiana. We fifteen years old. I'm carrying my rifle out in the woods every day, shooting shit. So uh, I don't know where we got the ammo from. There must have been some sitting around the house. Um, But it's not like I had any luxuries. I had a roof over my head. Uh, the air condition worked. I wasn't in a crack house. I admitted all that. I didn't. I didn't have a Kanye upbringing. Nobody beat me up every day. My uncle didn't have sex with me. Um, but I watched my mama clip coupons. And I watched my mom. She knew every time the plumber came over, she was going to get screwed. And if she went out and bought a car, that car had to be twelve years old before she would trade that car in. My first car was $500. It was a, a, a Ford Mustang. So I, I I didn't say I was dirt poor, that I ate worms from the ground in Nigeria. <laughs> uh, but, but we were terrified about money, man. We had a little bit of money. My mama had some money, man, but we were scared of it. She didn't tell me when she died at 89 years old, she would still not tell me how much money was in that life insurance. She wouldn't tell anybody, dude, because she was terrified if she told somebody, they'd get the money. We lived off of dividends checks that she would get every quarter and, and Social Security, whatever that was, three or 400 bucks every two weeks. Yeah, I actually looked up I went to socialsecurity.gov uh, and I looked up how much my pension is going to be. And it's like, if I cash it out at 65, I'm going to be making something like $750 a month. Yeah. But if I wait until I'm 70, it goes up to like 1200 or 1100 Because I guess they're counting on me to die <laughs> within yeah. those five years. And I'm like, yo, like I've paid millions of dollars in taxes over the course of my life. And this is what I get at my retirement, $750? Like, are you serious right now? Like, this is crazy. Yeah. Like, you, if you it's even there to pay you. Yeah. Um, you know, and when you're 80, what's, what's 1200 bucks worth when you're 80? Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. You know, in the book, you said, focus on now. The only time that's important is now and the future. So you never focus on the past? Try not to. It's over, man. What am I going to do about it? You know, psychotics are stuck there. It makes me crazy thinking about yesterday. I can't do anything about it. I lost a deal. I lost a deal two days ago. What, what am I going to do? I can't, I can't keep running it over like... What am I going to do to put the deal back together? That That's a better thing. You know, you get a flat tire, man. The thing is, you, you, you guys can kill each other about her hitting the curb and getting the tire flat. But somebody's got to change the damn thing. Yeah, it's, uh, I see this with people around me. Like, people will hit a roadblock and then just shut down. Um, you know, like, for for example... I was looking online and I was looking at furniture, right? And because uh, I have to buy some new furniture for my house. So I said, okay, well, I mean, I, I could buy it in cash, but let's just say I financed it, right? Now, if you, let's just say you buy two, three thousand dollars worth of furniture, you could pay it off in three months, 
and you pay no interest. Or you could pay it off in 12 months and pay 100% interest. <laughs> like, it almost seems like you have these programs that will keep the poor even poorer, if that's even possible. 100% interest? So I either pay 2,000 in three months or I pay 4,000 in 12 months. And if I don't pay that 4,000 in 12 months, then there's gonna be a bunch of other charges on top of that. And it's like, yo, the furniture is only probably worth a thousand bucks. It's such a predatory type of thing where the people at the bottom just become roadkill. I think um, totally, dude. Warren Buffett, yeah, Warren Buffett even said that. He said that America's low, low cl- lowest class right now is becoming roadkill. Do you agree? It's a, uh, it's not uh, financial inequality. It is educational inequality. Like. The people are pay, playing by a completely different set of rules. You know, the intention, the intention of the poor is to pay the bills because somebody said, hey, you can't change your condition. It's not true. All you got to do is ask yourself a different question. Who has changed their condition in your community? Tell, tell me about somebody that broke out of urban uh, Baltimore that that there's not a rapper, not a ball player, but they broke out. They did something without a scholarship, without any super talents. They didn't get lucky as a rapper, and they and they made it out. Like, you got to figure out, who am I going to mimic? Who am I going to edify? Who am I going to follow? They're probably not on Instagram. They're, they're, probably, they're probably running a business. How do I get connected with those people? How do I get out, man? Like, like the attention has to be a commitment to getting out Wh- wherever you are. And if, if, but if you think you're fine or if you think you're stuck, then you are roadkill, regardless of where you're at. You could be in the middle class with memberships to a country club and two BMWs. It's got the same issues. I know guys, I know guys that are paying... So much interest for their homes, their cars, their cu- country clubs, and their kids' tuitions. I was with a guy on the way over here, paid $350,000 to send his kid to school, and she works at Whole Foods today. That's roadkill, dude. And, and remember, to, to, to feed the institutions on this planet, it takes more than that many poor people. It takes a lot of middle class people. Because that $1.4 trillion of college debt, that was on the backs of the middle class. Well, I personally don't believe that there's a middle class. I, I look at I'm society as either, as either rich or poor. And the definition of rich is when you have money that's making you money. The definition of poor is when you're making enough to pay your bills. I'm with it you. doesn't matter if, if you're making 100000 or even 200000 or 50000 If you're not, If your money isn't actually making you money, you are poor. That's just it. Whereas, like, there's a famous quote where it said, um, hold on, I'm going to pull this up right now. Uh, where is it? Yeah, yeah, I think if, if you don't uh, learn how to earn passive income, you're going to spend your whole life earning or dying uh, earning income. Exactly. Hold on. Where yeah, it's, it's a Warren Buffett quote, man. You love Warren, man. You, you... I love him. Yeah, because, dude, he, he, he's sane. He's practical. His advice is practical. Okay, so here we go. Uh, this is a quote by uh, Edgar Br- uh, Bronfman, Bronfman Sr., who is the owner of Seagram's. Yeah. With a net worth of $2.6 billion. He says to turn $100 into $110 is work. To turn $100 million into $110 million is inevitable. I love that. Love that. And the games are different today because the banks pay almost nothing. You know, like when, when I was growing up in the 70s, the, the banks were paying 10, 10 and 11, 12%. Today they're paying 0.012%. That's 12 tenths of 1%. It would take eight years to earn one point. Yet, yet what do people do with their money? They put it in the bank. They open a checking account or a savings account to store their money there until they can send it off to Wall Street. Yeah. Yeah. And with interest rates going down 
I remember I had my money in something called a preferred checking account, which was making like 2.5%. And then after the interest rate drops, the interest rates dropped, it went down to like 1.73. And I'm like, really? Like, <laughs> Yeah, but you see, and, see, the people you're talking about wouldn't even see the change. Right? And they're like, oh, throw up their hands. I can't do anything about it. So you guys that are watching right now, maybe you post in comments or wherever you want to post it, like, I'm not bashing on you. I've been there. Vlad's been there. You got to pay attention. You got to pay attention. You got to decide, I'm going to break the cycle. I'm going to get out of the trap. And if you don't, it goes back to what Vlad was saying earlier, you're going to be roadkill. Like if you don't get out of harm's way, they will run you over. I mean, when you look at what's been happening, like when the crash happened back in 2008, they lowered interest rates extremely low, and it was supposed to be a temporary situation. 11, 12 years later, interest rates are basically still at zero. You can't maintain that forever. From your point of view, as someone that deals with hundreds of millions of dollars, like what's going to happen if interest rates just stay this low for the next 5, 10 years? Rates are going lower, my friend. They've been, they've been 20 years in Japan. They've been in negative numbers, negative zero. That means if you put money in a bank in Japan today, a year from now, you end up with less money than you put in a bank, even if you didn't make a withdrawal. Germany, same case. Okay, you cannot have world rates. The, the, the world, Germany and Japan are competitors for money. So if I can go to Germany and get my money cheaper than, than, than here, I'm going to go there and get my money cheaper until at which point they'll lower here as well. It just shows you the the world. The world is now connected, and the consumer is full of debt, and has it, it just does not have anything left over at the end of the month. The wealthy get wealthier, the poor get poorer, and that will continue until the poor, one at a time. Uh, make a decision. Hey, I'm not. I'm going to break the cycle here for me. I can't break it for everybody. I can't, you, you know, everybody that hears this, less than 1% of the people that see this today will take advantage of it. 99% will critique it, maybe comment on it, hate on it, judge it, find out where I was wrong, find out where you were wrong. Less than 1% will say, hey, I got to wake up. I got to change what I'm doing and I got to start paying attention to my money. Just that little thing that you just said from 2.5 to 1.7, that's a massive change in what they were paying you. And, and, and you saw it. And then you got to figure out, okay, where am I going to go to protect my money? That's now mine, at least temporarily my money. Where can I go to start earning uh, five or 6% a year so that my money can grow and I don't lose it while it's growing. Yeah, because that's actually lower than inflation. That's so right. Technically, I'm losing money every day by having it in this interest-bearing account, which is way higher than any checking account. And, and the reason you have it at that bank or whatever bank is because somewhere along the line, you and I were convinced that banks are safe. And that we should yeah. keep some cash we should have a cushion and the cash is king when the truth is it's just pieces of paper that are garbage. They're worthless until they're recirculated, until they're leveraged. Your money, bro, would be better off buying ads than sitting at Wells Fargo. Hmm. I feel you. I feel you. So how much are you sitting on right now? I'm sorry? How much are you sitting on? A few dollars. A few dollars, enough to afford this nice office that you're sitting in right now. Uh, unlike you, I don't, I don't plaster all my, uh, my finances to the world. <laughs> I don't think I, I didn't plaster mine either. Yeah, well, you gave a little more info than I did. Okay. Okay, so what's next for Grant Cardone? I'm going to go to dinner. That's what I know is next. Okay. Business-wise, what's next for you? Uh, well, we're here in the city doing some things, a couple of interesting projects we're looking at doing. I'm definitely going to buy some more real estate. We'll get that. That should be at $2 billion by 2020. Uh, keeping in mind that my first deal started with three grand. That's a pretty big move over, even though it took 30 years. Um, 
but we got some TV interest and some some stuff that that uh, that, that we might do, and and um, we got our our annual event in Vegas this year, our 10X Growth Conference, Mandalay Bay Convention. Well, that thing's almost sold out, <coughs> and I got another book or two with me. Yeah, I mean, we talked about one of the interviews you just put out, and, and you guys you and the guy that was interviewing you who, who worked for you was saying how even though you don't have to work, there's something within you that you want to work, that something that you love. Where you could just, you have more money than you could spend right now, but yet you're in love with the actual work itself, which is what gets you up every morning and has you doing all these multiple projects. Look, if, if you gave me more money tomorrow, I'd, I'd still show up at work. So... If I had a billion dollars, if I had ten billion dollars given to me tomorrow, I'd we'd I'd go to work. So it's what I do. It's it makes me feel good. I like doing it. I like contributing. I think, you know, if you have kids, you see your kids. They 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 want to they want to mimic you. They want to do things. They want to you know you play with a phone. They play with a phone. You put your shoes on. They want to put shoes on. Like it's, I, I think that's we're, we're all trying to contribute. We're trying to give back. And there's not a person listening right now that doesn't want to help somebody else out. And if any of you that are listening right now are watching, you, you get into a position where you can help other people out in life because you did something right or you learned how not to do something, you're probably going to feel some inclination to want to help other people out. And, and look, I overcame a drug problem that, that, that almost killed me. So I, I, know, I know that people can get off of drugs. I didn't have any money at 25 years old. None, zero. I was broke. I was in debt. Um, I got out of that situation. I hated a sales job I had at 26 years old. I figured out how to fall in love with a sales job, as hard as that is to believe. Uh, I've always wanted to write a book. You know, if you write your first book, it's not easy. But I've written eight of them. I always wanted to write them. One of them's a New York Times bestseller, okay? Uh, the other seven sold more books than 95% of all books have ever sold. So I've done some things that, that people told me I couldn't do. Uh, my first real estate deal was one house. I own a bunch of real estate today. Did, at one time, I couldn't, didn't think I could land the right girl for my life, that I was going uh, to end up with a bunch of uh, uh, Girls in my life that I didn't didn't respect and didn't want to spend my time with, and and I finally got the right girl, two beautiful children, and, and I think something. I I feel good about myself. I remember Vlad when I was 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20 years old. I hated myself. I had zero self worth, none. Today today when I wake up, for the most part, I feel you know, on a scale from one to a hundred, I'm like, I'm gonna give myself a 94 today. Better than my grades in college. That's what it is. Grant Cardone. You're the Always man, a dude. Pleasure. Always a pleasure. Appreciate you reaching out okay. uh, this time. And, I mean, can't wait to do it again. You got it, brother. Be great. No doubt. Peace.